<laughs> You'll laugh at me. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> That's right. I've got a podium here. I can hide behind the podium. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. I'm glad you all made it up here. Um, so, I'll, I guess you guys, are, um, I'm not good with names, let's put it that way. So, I'm going to say, hey, you, or look at you blankly. I know Joel, I remember that name, and I know Nicole, so forgive me if I don't get your name right, okay? I'm Stephen Don, I'm Associate Professor up here in the Diesel and Ag Mechanics. I've been teaching here about 11 years. Um, very, very familiar with the, the same type of world that you guys are in, in the agricultural world. I've been involved with that for, oh, let's just say going on 50-something years. Let's just end it right there. I have a, uh, an ag business degree. Um, I majored in farm management and uh, minored in, ag oh, actually farm management and financing and uh, minored in ag engineering. I went through the diesel program here and I have my master's through billing, so I'm pretty well adept with the agricultural world. I did have my own business. I worked on ranches and farms and ranches for most of my life, and I did have an, my own uh, repair business after I got my diesel degree in a little town called Geraldine, Montana, just south of Fort Benton. Early 2000s, the rural economy kind of went to hell in a handbasket in the little town, so when this job came up, I kind of jumped on it. Started off in automotive and ag mechanics in 2008. Um, one of our diesel faculty retired, uh, Bob Miller, some of you might have known him. And when he retired, I took all over all of his uh, diesel classes. So I teach fuel systems, uh, shop management. Uh, it's a freshman fuel systems and an advanced fuel systems. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about fuel systems today. Uh, shop management, uh, electronic engines, and uh, chassis. So the chassis would be air brakes, uh, on highway and off highway, suspension systems, air systems, uh, frames, wheels and tires, etc. So, kind of touching a lot of different stuff. All right. So, what what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have you guys go around one by one, just introduce yourselves to me again, where you're from. I also want you to tell me one thing that you want to learn over the next couple of days, because right, I could stand up here for two days straight with a whole bunch of jibber jabber and not tell you a damn thing that you want to know. <laughs> All right, so starting right here, Joel. All right, well, I'm Joel Schumacher, um, ag economist on campus in Bozeman, and originally from Malta. Oh, right on, right on. Um, so what do I want to know? Hmm. So you guys in the back get to think on this just a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> we can come back to you if you want. No. Um, <laughs> So probably the piece that I know the least about is the ballasting. Okay, okay, good, because we have a big section on ballasting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That'll be right, yeah. Okay, right on. I'm Tim Fine uh, from Sydney, and one of the questions that came up last year in doing uh, one of the audits that I did was the producer asked about whether it's more efficient if you're gonna be away from the tractor for few minutes, half hour, whatever, whether it's more efficient to shut the tractor down and then restart it or just leave it running. So Good. I, I have a, actually, we have a handout on that. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So. All right. You guys are hitting the mark. For, we're two for two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm Tracy Mosley. I'm from Livingston, Park County. Um, and I guess I don't even know enough to know what I want to know, <laughs> except for I'm going to hone in on the things that I think probably could help my producers save money. Okay, okay, all right. And that's the, kind of the, the whole aim of the whole thing is right. to save our producers money, right? Yeah. yeah. So little so, pieces here and there. Sure, yeah. Have you met just a, a sidebar, Joel La Liberty? Uh -huh. he, okay, he's, I know the name. Yeah, he's, from, he's a friend of mine. He's down in Livingston, I believe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, cool. Is he a, a farmer? No, he oh. works for, <clears throat> is it FSA? Am I correct in saying the FSA? Mm -hmm. So the government agency yeah. blending, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ben Hotman, and I'm just over in Chinook. Just down the road, yeah, yeah. right on. Um, I guess I'm kind of the same boat as Tracy as far as limited knowledge of the actual diesel engines, um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, and Ben Tim's point was good too, like those little questions like that that. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of our farmers would you know ask every day i think those that would be really helpful sure picking up all sure that. yeah okay so, Right on. We'll get it covered. Yeah. We'll get it covered. Are all about saving money, so. yeah, yeah, absolutely they are. They have to. The main point. Yeah. And then you'll think yeah. back, if you're like me, to all the times you ran the tractor and yeah. all the things you did wrong. That's <laughs> what I'm trying to do <laughs> right now when I got home that. Gotcha. Dave Ryan and our Right, right. <laughs> Is that good or bad? Just separate yourself. Just separate yourself. No, I came up from Butte, and uh, you know I'm all about uh, all kinds of different energy efficiency technology. So and just how how we can uh, help these guys uh, make their equipment more efficient. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Uh, Jake Tanner and from the Big Red Family. Very limited knowledge in this area as well. I guess I am curious to know the efficiency difference between the newer diesel models and, the, and some of the sure. other. Yep, um, and we're going to hit on that too. Absolutely. Uh, personally, I have interest in me, so. Okay, right on. Right on. Okay. I'm Emily Walker from Galveston County. And limited knowledge as well, but um, maybe just having enough little bits of information that I could help somebody maybe select of you know what tractor is right for the job in terms of efficiency. Oh, okay, sure, yeah, yeah. Application, good. That's good. Yeah, that's not on my list, but it will be. Yeah, because I can change things tonight. Yeah, all right, <laughs> right on. <laughs> um, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I, one of the downfalls that I have as a instructor, and I'll just jump into my, like my freshman fuels class, I guess I have preconceived ideas that my students know stuff about things I'm talking about. And sometimes they do, and a lot of times they don't. And we just told you we don't. Exactly, and I'm glad you did that. Let so I'm, clear. you know, be cl clear on that. You know, so I get into my legs and I just kind of jibber jabber on and, and some are thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another is like, what in the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so one requirement I have, uh, uh, including you guys, of all my classes is please ask questions. All right. There is no such thing as a stupid question. The only stupid question is the one that is not asked. If you don't ask, then I have no idea, right? So please, if it's, um, if it's related to the topic or if it's something we're digressing, ask the question, please, all right? Um, we're going to start off with uh, more some, I guess, covering a little bit of a ground roots. You know, we'll, we'll talk a little about the internals of the engine. Uh, this is not an engines class. It's not a fuels class, but you need to know a little bit about what's happening inside that component, okay? Um, then we're going to actually, let's just go through these slides. So on our agenda, well, let's, let's go with our housekeeping first, okay? So, how many, well, really? Good Lord. So, folks, can you help me out here? What time did this class start again? <laughs> Hi, Nicole. Good, how are you? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> you want to, we can put a chair over here somewhere. <laughs> so you're on the hot seat now, my young friend. Okay. We just got done introducing ourselves, and so what I would like you to do is introduce yourself, and obviously we know you, who you are and where you're from, but I want to know one thing that you want to learn from this session. <sighs> one thing I want to learn. Building a tractor maintenance schedule that I can give to farmers that is oh, okay. easy to understand. That PM I can schedule. Give like a handout, so and I can kind of go from there. Okay. So that's one more thing that's going on, on my list tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that actually I didn't hear that. That's that's good. Um, both of you guys come up with some good stuff. So what I'm going to do is um, I'll probably visit with you guys just a little bit more later. And uh, I can make some changes tonight, but that's a good one to have on your list because that's something you can all share with your ag, ag producers, okay? And when, I, when we're talking about ag producers, you guys are dealing with grain farmers, with probably hog farmers or sheep farmers, with cattle, um, oil seeds, you know, you name it, it's out there. So a lot of what we talk about um, 
is not just for a diesel engine. Some of the stuff we talk about is going to work for gasoline engines. All right, uh, for example, what Nicole said, a PM, what we call a PM schedule, preventive maintenance. Now, you want to save money, you don't wait till this freaking thing breaks. <laughs> all right, you, you, you do your preventive maintenance, your PMs, you're checking your fluids, you're checking your coolant, you're checking your belts, etc. And we're going to cover a lot of that stuff, but to actually have a PM schedule, um, that'd be a good thing to, to kind of run through. Maybe we'll do that tomorrow, okay? So, um, I'm thinking probably most of you have not been in this building before. Is that a fair assumption? All right, so, restrooms. If you go out this door and you head about 20 feet that direction, there's a hallway, you take a left in the hallway, that's where you find the restrooms. All right? Um, if you open the door up, the, the room's going to be dark. Don't be afraid because they're automatic lights. All right? They'll click on off by themselves. Um, breaks. We'll try and take regular breaks. I mean, uh, I'm up here walking around, so I'm stretching my back out and stretching my legs out. Uh, well, if you feel like I'm rambling on too long, you need a break, please tell me. Don't be afraid to get up and stretch out. Get a cup of coffee, there's donuts, so we got uh, goodies in the cooler back there, so please help yourself, okay? Lunch, we are on our own for lunch, so we'll probably take lunch about 12-ish. We'll kind of see where we're on the schedule, all right? Uh, and I'm thinking probably about 45 minutes to an hour for lunch, all right? You're probably gonna have to run downtown or whatever, so probably about an hour, okay? Uh, any other questions on our housekeeping? All right. Um, one thing too, please, I would, would, would kindly ask if you would turn your cell phones to vibrate, and I know you're probably going to have calls come in. Don't be afraid to take the calls. If you just excuse yourself and just go out the door, we would appreciate it. Okay. So we are going to have a lot of discussion. All right. And as I said, I do require all of my classes, including you guys, to ask questions. All right. If there's something you need to know, I, you know, I'm good at a lot of things. I really suck at reading minds, all right? So let's ask those questions, okay? Smile, Nicole, it's okay to smile too. There you go. You look like you're totally pissed. Sorry. <laughs> God, I love thinking on Nicole. Most of our activities are gonna be in here, all right? We will be taking a couple of short field trips. So this is our, was what the building we call the ATC, the Applied Technology Center. Uh, the building right across the street, about you know, 50 yards over there, big overhead doors is called the Farm Mechanics Building. We'll go over there. Um, we're going to look at some, some engines and components over there. <coughs> we're also going to take a trip down to the, to the kind of the end of the street down here to what we call the Davy Pioneer Lab. And that's where actually I teach a fuels class, and we have an engines class down there too. So we're going to look at a bunch of components down there as well. Okay? And those will be kind of components that, you're, um, that you need to kind of be halfway familiar with because your, your agro producers have all these components on their piece of equipment, on highway, off highway, doesn't matter, and all the engines, transmissions, et cetera, okay? Now, again, this is not an engines class, it's not a fuels class, it's not a transmissions class, it's not an air brakes class, but you need to be kind of grounded in a little bit of, of everything of those of all the above, okay? So, questions thus far? All right, so I'm gonna give you this handout, <coughs> which is not stapled, because I wanted you to be able to kind of take notes on some of this, you will note, most of you can see this, but on the very bottom right corner, right down here, they are numbered. All right, so if you were to drop them on the floor, you can pick them up and put them back in order. You. You're welcome. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> welcome. <Thank> you. <coughs> You're welcome. <coughs> uh, a couple of things I didn't tell you. Uh, with the season changes and my asthma is flaring up a little, so you'll hear me coughing just a bit. The second thing is, I've talked with Joel about this. Um, we are going, I'm going to email to Joel um, several handouts, including this one, and some other material which Joel's going to put up in a secure site for you guys. That will be in PDFs. You can download them, you can print them, distribute them to your ag producers, do whatever you need to do with them. All right? So. The nice thing about being a teacher, instructor, leader of a workshop, I get to ask questions, which is pretty cool. So there's your first question. What is efficiency? Can you guys give a definition re re relating to your agricultural producers, what they or you would determine as efficiency when we're dealing with, with, with vehicles or pieces of equipment? Okay, what would you guys think of as, as the word efficiency would mean in that realm? 
accomplishing a job with minimal time and money. Okay, minimal time and money. Okay, I'll go. I'll buy off on that. I guess not to oversimplify it, but basically getting the most bang for your buck. An ROI, return on investment, right? Okay, I'll go for that. Yeah. Anyone else want to add in? Reducing waste if it's you know in terms of fuel, money, whatever. Yep. Yep. Okay. So the dollars you and fuel, by the way, I just bought 100 gallons of dyed fuel for my class next week and the week after, three dollars sixty a gallon. It's not cheap, all right? And you know, farmers, or well, I should use the term ag producers, um, that's a huge cost. An on-highway fleet, the two largest costs for an on-highway fleet of trucks is fuel and tires. Guess what? That's a huge cost for your ag producers. What's an ag, a, a four-wheel drive tractor, a good tire, you're, you're talking two to three thousand dollars per tire. That doesn't include mounting, doesn't include discarding of the old tire, and times that by eight. That's a lot of, lot of money, all right? Okay, good answers, guys. Anyone want to add to those? Okay, so efficiency, and you guys pretty much hit it right on the head, it's a return on your investment. One of the poorest, it's, it's the best investment and the poorest investment that an ag producer can make is a four-wheel drive tractor or a combine, okay? Uh, we will be looking at a 600 horsepower Case IH Steiger tractor, quad track. It's damn near a half a million dollar tractor. And how many weeks of the year is that producer <laughs> going to use that again? Like, yeah, maybe a month or more, okay. Well, that's a pretty poor investment. But you know what? If he doesn't have or she doesn't have that tractor, they're not going to make any damn money, right? So it's a pretty gosh darn good investment. Same with a combine. All right, John Deere combine, a class eight combine, their new ones is, you know, over, was well, close to $400,000 without the header. The engine alone is $98,000. So we better be having some preventive maintenance to make sure that engine lasts for a, a, a lots and lots of hours, okay? So that's the type of stuff we're gonna be looking at. Okay, ideal in systems. And we're going to be talking about, I have next slide, I have a whole slurry of systems we're going to look at. So I'm talking about the fuel system, the cooling, the lubrication system, wheels and tires, ballasting, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to kind of take little bits and you know, go through all of those systems. At the end of the day, <coughs> that all those systems have to come together so that we have an efficient operation. All right? And part of that would be, I think someone said about getting you, you, the right application of the tractor. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I sold tires when I was in business. I mean, I, you know, you are going to be semi-quasi a subject matter expert, an SME, all right? So I was an SME for tires. Hell, I could sell a tire to anyone I wanted to, and they took my word that I was selling the right tire to them. So part of your job as, as agents is to make sure that the customer or your, your egg producer, excuse me if I use the word customer, same type of thing, has the right equipment for what their operation is. Okay, so that gets back to the, app, the correct application. All right. Holy crap. <laughs> so how long, was this two days or three days? <laughs> yeah. We got a lot of stuff we're gonna talk about. All right. Um, Fuel intake, and uh, I've divvied this up into two different sections. We're actually going to talk about the physical liquid fuel itself. We're also going to, I think it's like down about here somewhere, we're going to talk about the fuel components of the system. So injectors, uh, filters is a huge issue. The fuel tank alone is a huge issue, all right? So we're going to talk about those. Intake system, exhaust cooling, lube, electrical, wheels, tires, ballasting, ha. Huh. This one right here. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the exhaust after treatment. All right. Because of the federal government, you know that we have these things called emission devices. All right. On highway, 2014 was the drop dead date. And it's called the emissions for diesel engines on highway went in what's called a tier system. So we had tier zero, tier one, two, three, tier four interim or tier 4i, and tier 4 final, or tier 4f, or tier 4b. All right, now that's just for North America. 
those same emissions requirements are now hitting the off-highway. 2017 is a drop-dead date. So that is marine, construction, mining, forestry, agriculture, etc. So you're gonna see the same devices that were used in your diesel pickups and your Dodges and your Fords, your semi-trucks is now gonna be, we're actually gonna see some on that Steiger tractor across the street. Love it or hate it, it really doesn't matter. It's not going away. It is here to stay. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's going to be self-regulating, okay. and the reason I say that is that the new um, after treatment is called SCR, Selective Catalytic Reduction. So I'm, uh, let me, I'm going to circle back to that question, just if I forget, just ask that again. So are you guys kind of familiar with the four strokes of an engine? Okay, so let's revisit those real quick. So in our engine, we have this piston, right? So when the piston comes down on the intake stroke, the intake valve opens up, and in a diesel engine, the turbocharger will force air, cool, dense air, into that, um, what we call the combustion chamber. So the, the piston's here, we have a combustion chamber here, we have the bottom of our head up here, right? We go down to bottom dead center. When the piston comes back up, it's on the next stroke, it's called compression. Now these engines are a compression ignition engine. There is no spark plug in a diesel engine. Actually, I'll put two caveats on that. There is a spark plug in the diesel engine if it runs off natural gas, which probably your consumers don't have. There is also a spark plug in the, one of the after-treatment devices, which we'll talk about later. But for all intents and purposes, we're compression ignition. So when that air gets compressed, it gets super hot. Right, because it's not going anywhere. We're just smushing that air down, all right? So many degrees before top dead center on, when that piston's coming up, the, and we're gonna inject some fuel. Now that could be a mechanical pump. We're gonna look at a couple of mechanical pumps. No electronics whatsoever, old school. Or it could be totally dependent upon the ECM. We're gonna also look at those newer ones, all right? Those injectors and those ECMs. So are gonna put a shot of fuel in there. It might actually be um, multiple shots of fuel. We'll talk about that a little later. That ignites. Piston comes up, it's the next stroke, and that ignites, it's a, basically it's a controlled explosion. All right, and it forces that piston back down, that's our power stroke, then at the bottom of the throat comes back up, and that would be our exhaust stroke. That's when the exhaust valve opens up and we spit the crap out the other end. Okay, inside that combustion chamber, we will create a lot of power, we will burn our fuel, we will also create emissions. There is no physical way inside that combustion chamber to take care of all the emissions. If you do something to the timing of the engine to take care of one emission, then something else happens. So, one example. <coughs> Fuel goes in, it's atomized, it goes in these teeny little droplets. All right? And they burn from the outside in. Everything burns from the outside in, right? They get hot, the vapor gives off, they burn. If the droplets are too big, they won't completely burn, right? So that is called hydrocarbons. So when that goes out, um, remember, yeah, we used to run downtown or out in the field. When we open that throttle up, we see that really cool looking black smoke come out and tell, God, I love that stuff. Just love it. Well, apparently EPA didn't, all right? So they slapped on this thing called a DPF, a diesel particulate filter. And that actually filters out that unburned hydrocarbons or that soot, okay? So, in order to make sure we completely burn all that fuel, we need to raise the temperatures inside that combustion chamber. All right, that makes sense. So if I raise the combustion temperatures, I'm gonna burn that, all that hydrocarbons. Well, what is the majority of our air made up of? Nitrogen, right? Nitrogen is an inert gas until you reach a critical temperature. So if we reach a critical temperature inside that combustion chamber, now we start burning the nitrogen. We're gonna take care of the, the um, fuel, but now we're gonna start burning the nitrogen. And that is a, a group of uh, emissions called NOx, N-O-X. It's about four different nitrogens combined into NOx, okay? And that, to circle back to your question, Nicole, is where we, what we call an SCR. So we're gonna keep the combustion temperatures nice and toasty warm to take care of that, the fuel. And we're going to use an SCR system on the, on the exhaust side to take care of the NOx. 
Silic uh, selective catalytic reduction, basically where you will, your customer, your, your egg producer, or you guys if you got diesel pickups, will buy what's called DEF, diesel exhaust fluid. It's basically 33% urea and the rest is, is um, distilled water. And that's all it is. So back to your question about how it's regulated, it's self-regulated, because inside those urea tanks, all those DEF tanks, there is monitors. There's a quality monitor, and there's also a basically just a physical level monitor. Number one, if you're quality, I mean, I've, I've had customers tell me, well, I can just dump diesel fuel, just dump water in there. Oh, go ahead. It's not going to work out too good for you. All right, well, I'll just let the tank run dry and I won't fill it up. Well, go ahead. It's not going to work out too good for you. Because under federal regulations, all that's monitored. And there's going to be different, different manufacturers you do a little bit different, but basically we're looking at key cycles. So if you run that engine, and actually it's key cycles in miles, on highway, federal regulations state that you can run on a low tank of DEF for 800 miles. If you do not fill up that tank, then there's going to be some strategies built in. You might go to a limp hone, it might derate the engine, you might start that engine three more times and you don't start anymore in a conversation, right? So it's going to be self-regulating. Does that kind of answer your question? So your customers, there's nothing they can do about that. Um, I've heard of uh, DPF delete kits, you know, for pickup trucks, you can take out that diesel particulate filter and put in these dummy sensors and all that happy horse palucky. Not a good idea. You know, I'm not, I'm not totally green, but I do know that we are screwing up our atmosphere with the emissions. And that's something that, you know, you're all educators, you, you kind of need to educate your, your egg producers that they really don't want to cut that stuff out. Um, the flip side of that is, you know, one, one device that we'll look at real quick, like, is an EGR. And automotive has used EGR for, like, you know, decades. Exhaust gas recirculation. So we're taking some of the exhaust gas, dumping it back into the cylinder, and that was their, their way of trying to control the NOx. It was actually cooling down the cylinder temperatures. Well, that was all fine and dandy, but once we start cooling down the temperatures, then we're not burning all the fuel. So now our hydrocarbons go up. So now we have to stuff on a DPF filter, just as it was a vicious circle. And that when, when the engine manufacturers on the diesel side just use the EGR, fuel mileage went to hell in a handbasket. It was absolutely terrible. And there was lots and lots of issues. We had you know, plugged up intake valves, we had plugged up metering valves for you know, the, the percentage of the, the exhaust that was going in. It, was just, it, was, it just did not work. Did not work. On paper, oh, it worked absolutely perfect. In real life, no, nah, not so much. All right. So now we, are, we have progressed to the SCR. I don't see that going away anytime soon. In fact, I don't see it going away at all. So I have a couple of questions. So how do these exhaust after treatments affect efficiency? The SCR has actually raised efficiency. It's actually they're running a lot cleaner. Um, I was one of the, the big employers that comes on campus is, is a company called Kiwit. And they have a big presence there. Um, they're actually the, one of the largest private construction companies in North America. And they have a big presence in California. Well, if you want to talk air quality control, let's talk about California. Those guys are nuts down there, complete nuts. Some of their equipment they're running in California, the air is cleaner, or the exhaust is cleaner coming out than the air going in, because yeah, it's cleaning that well. I mean, so these things, that the, the engines are running are a lot cleaner. They're running a lot more efficiently. If, if, if we can get the exhaust taken care of with after treatment, then I can raise those cylinder temperatures, so I'm going to burn that fuel. So we're, uh, we're creating less hydrocarbons. We're also, if I dump in three, uh, this is three dollars and sixty gallon of fuel in Haver, Montana, into that engine, I'm getting more bang for my buck. So they are a lot more efficient. EGR, not so much. They, they just, this actually sucked. All right, but the newer, the new ones, the DPF, coupled with um, the SCR system, very efficient, very efficient. I've heard really, really good things about those. Really good things. So when you say self-regulated, that means that if they have existing exhaust system, they can have to add these on? No, no, they do not. No, 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 this is for newer, for... So it's, it's, it's manufacturer-induced, yes. from 2014? Well, actually, it's, a, it's not manufacturer-induced, it's actually EPA-induced. Right. So the regulations that put on the manufacturer, the manufacturer, depending on model year, has to do what's needed for that particular model year. So will they conduct audits to see if people are taking... 
Um, well, some of the components you can take out there, your delete kits, but if you try and take that like that selective skeletal reduction SCR off, you're going to shut your engine down because that's built into the software. And there's nothing you can do to get into that software. You try hacking on there. Well, I'm sure people can hack in, but these little things with auto trails. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. So, and legally, if, if your vehicle, with the Beyond Highway Off Highway, comes with some type of mission to control the device, um, if you take it off and sell it with a taken off, you don't want to get caught doing that. Let's put it that way. I mean, this business is shut down because but of that. But if it's, if in general, more efficient, there's no reason for people to Exactly. Like that. But it's perception. Right. All right. So the perception is that, well, this stuff's bad. bad. Let's just get rid of it. Well, actually, you no. Know, some of it is bad, yeah. The EGR was really <laughs> bad. SCR, is, is, I think, is exceptionally good. It really is. So what do you think about... Now, with Colt, I'll use Ford for an example. I mean, they have those kits to bypass the EBR, um, which people do all the time. Just don't get cold. <laughs> oh, I mean, they, they, they do it. They do it all the time. I mean, I always have problems with my EBR. I'm always buying another one, or it's wearing out, or, you know. Oh, yeah, the biggest thing is they get plugged off. 300 bucks. Yeah. Um, a pop, so. Right, right. You know, you don't want to buy them too often. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you about that because I, I think EGR sucks. It really does. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. On paper, it was, you, you look at the specs on paper, damn, that's a pretty nice system. That should work. You get out in the field or the highway, no, not even close. So, yeah, there's a lot of companies make delete kits out there. Um, I know there's a lot of companies are in a lot of trouble because of that. There's one in, Cal in uh, Colorado that was supplying a local dealership here with the leak kits. And the owner was, I don't know if he did go to jail, but he was facing jail time. The one in, Calif in uh, Colorado, and he faced a six, he was over $100,000 in fines because of those kits. So the local guy here doesn't get them from them anymore because they got shut down by the EPA. So you know, it depends on, on, I guess, who you're dealing with. But, if I had a vehicle, well, number one, I don't think I would buy a vehicle with just an EGR on it. But if I had one, I would, I, personally, I'd be looking for a delete kit. I really would. Yeah. And those DPFs are, are expensive. Um, for, we'll look at a couple of engines across in the farm mechanics that have DPFs, a diesel particulate filter on them. Um, those ones, I guess, I think are about five grand a piece. Some of the larger construction, your ag tractors, you might be, you're, you're into five figures. Um, I went to a big expo in um, March of this year down in Las Vegas, Con Ag Expo, it was a construction exhibition, and talked to a Volvo salesman down there for their loader, their off highway loader, their DPF is $25,000. All right, so these tractors, we'll look at one across the street, we're probably looking. Well, between five to ten thousand for a DPF for that thing. All right, and a lot of your DPFs are coupled in with your EGR system, you know. But I mean, three hundred bucks once maybe, but if you have to keep replacing that on a regular basis, that's a that's a serious issue. Serious issue. Could yeah. you say one more time what EGR stands for? Exhaust exhaust gas recirculation. So we're taking some of the exhaust gas and recirculating it back into the intake to cool down those combustion temperatures. To, to, that was their first attempt to get rid of NOx. Okay. Um, in red here, you know, this is always a fun one. I used to love asking my customers this. Have you read the owner's manual, the operator's manual? And that was the exact <laughs> response I got. They just laughed at me. It's like, well, some said, well, what's that? <coughs> okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's in that stack. It's over in that stack over there. The yeah. With the, yeah. So that would be one thing that I would, would highly recommend that the, all of your ag producers to do. They should have an operator's manual, an owner's manual for every piece of equipment that they own. If they don't have one, they contact the dealer and they get one. And you can give them a homework of assignment to read the darn thing. <laughs> all right. Because there is a lot of the information we're going to look at here is right in the owner's manual or the operator's manual. Okay? This is a big thing right here. Some of your ag producers are actually very adept or adept uh, technicians. 
all right? They can take an engine apart and they can rebuild it, okay? They can take up a component, they can put it back on because they have to, it's what they do. Others are, they should never have a tool in their hand, <laughs> okay? And I'm pretty sure you know the ones I'm talking about, all right? So you're going to be dealing with some instances where a customer, uh, you might have, well, let's just pick on the fuel system because that's the one I know best. They have made some adjustments. They really didn't know what the heck they were doing, but they thought it sounded like a good idea at the time. So now they're going to call you and say, well, my tractor's not really efficient. My semi-truck's not really efficient, so what can I do about it? Well, so that's where you need to start going back and asking the questions of, well, why, what have you done, what have you had repaired, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, you know, some of you guys are probably pretty adept with a wrench in your hand as well. Others maybe not. But you, all, you, know, you need to be familiar with these components and ask those questions. Some of it is going to be out of the realm of both you and the, your ag producer. They need to be calling a dealership or repair facility to take care of what they shouldn't have done. Okay? That gets back to this right here. A lot of the stuff is going to be under warranty. Especially, you know, you're, you're dealing with some very old equipment. You're dealing with some brand spanking new equipment. Don't ever forget about these warranties. Even if it's an old piece of equipment that has a brand new fuel pump or a rebuilt fuel pump, that fuel pump's going to have a warranty issue with it. So if they're, th they're asking you, well, do you think I should adjust the pump to get more horsepower? Don't even go there. All right? You look at that pump, it's nice and shiny, it's got the little tags on it, say do not remove type of thing. Tell them they probably shouldn't be doing that. They probably should be talking to the dealership or the manufacturer of the pump, all right, for example. Okay? One that I should have up here in red is a word called safety. Don't ever, ever forget safety. Okay? Um, a pickup truck's a pickup truck. Compared with uh, that quad track or a loader tractor or a combine, pickup truck's pretty small. Pickup truck can still kill you. All right? It can still do some very serious damage. That quad track across the street. If you happen to get caught underneath <coughs> the tracks when that thing's moving, it's not even going to know you were there. There's just going to be a bloody mess on the floor once we go by. All right. Hydraulic pressures, we're looking at three, 4,000 PSI, all right, which is a lot of pressure. Compared with the new high-pressure common rail fuel system, that is nothing. The new high-pressure common rail fuel system, most of your customers, if they have it, and we'll talk about this fuel system later, is anywhere from 36 to 45,000 PSI. The latest one from Bosch, which is, is, is it's in the <coughs> automotive, it's in the Jaguar, the Mercedes-Benz, and the BMW diesels. Jaguar, Mercedes-Benz, BMW don't make fuel systems. They get theirs from Bosch. Theirs is pushing 50,000 PSI. That is some very serious, serious pressure. All right, so you do not screw with that at all. And I will look at a couple of those systems down uh, in our other building. And I'll give you some ideas of what you absolutely do not want to do. All right. Um, it was about five summers ago, one of my students went to a mine in northern Wyo uh, yeah, North Wyoming. And he was uh, working in, in the shop. And about a month before he got there, a technician was working on a high-pressure common rail system. It was on actually a Caterpillar engine on a, on a dozer. It was a D7 or D8. He was on a swing shift. So the technician before him had worked in the fuel system, did not tighten up one of the high-pressure lines. The technician came on board, and he wanted the operator to start the engine, or try to start it. He didn't think it was going to start. He thought it was going to start because everything was together. One fuel line was not connected <coughs> correctly. The fuel came out of that fuel line and hit it in the face. He had his safety glasses on. Unfortunately, his safety glasses were protecting his cap. So when the fuel went through his eyeball into his brain, it killed him. He had two kids and a wife. This is very serious, all right? So please, every time you talk to your ag producers, always talk about safety first. Always, always, always. We'll talk about you know, used oil. We change oil every day of the week. Diesel oil is a proven carcinogen. All right, used oil is a carcinogen. That means it will give you cancer. The best way to get something into your body, if you want to absorb it, is through the palms of your hands or the soles of your feet. So logic tells me I probably should have some damn gloves on when I change the oil on my diesel. All right? So, you know, latex, um, nitrile, rubber gloves, 
they're a dime a dozen down at HO or Carquest. Shit, just go and hell, buy them a box and give it to them. All right. Um, fuel pressures, hydraulic pressures, okay, all those types of things. Always talk safety to your guys, okay.